morning, Roy. Morning, Roger. Um, in this part of the uh, series, Roy, uh, we're going to look at the dropping of the pennies part of the book, um, which describes your own realisation um, that the extent of the democratic process uh, isn't functioning as advertised. Uh, it's my favourite part of the bo book, and uh, in, you say in all modesty that uh, this part of the book tells us, the readers, what qualifications you've earned um, to tell us what we can do about it. Um, so what qualifications were those, Roy? How did they come about? <laughs> qualifications is putting it a bit high. It's just loads and loads of experience and working with other people and being taught by them in the realm of... Um, participation and systems thinking. So it started really at the end of the 60s when the um, new non-broadcast video cameras came in, Sony uh, Porta Packs and things like that, where you had a little camera and a shoulder bag with a video recorder on it. And uh, I went to Hammersmith, as a matter of fact, and the American Borough Council and said, you know, you could use this to communicate with the people at Hammersmith and um, they could communicate back to you and so on. So, to cut a long story short, in the early 70s, Hammersmith came to me and said, we're ready to do that project, you know, the one we were talking about three years ago. So, I then um, did a couple of projects with them, uh, first of which was a disaster, because we uh, didn't understand group dynamics. First was a disaster, but they liked it very much, and they came back again and said, you know, the, we learned a lot from that, can we use video to... Um, as part of the participation process that you have to do on the Borough Town Plan. Mm -hmm. So we organized meetings in all the, all the um, wards of, the, of Hammersmith, and in each ward we ran a totally different kind of meeting, uh, essentially uh, using small group process. We had flip charts all around the wall, we trained facilitators from the Borough Town uh, Planning Department, and so when people turned up for the meeting, they were greeted with, a, instead of a platform of uh, suits, they were greeted with a young planner saying, um, showing them first of all a video film which was to explain what the Borough Town Plan was about, but secondly saying, okay, you see the film, uh, form around the video, the charts on the wall, those um, um, places on the wall where there's butcher paper up, and uh, the facilitator will help you to uh, flag up the things that you think the borough ought to be concerned about, Hammersmith ought to be concerned about in the um, uh, in making the borough town plan. And then uh, we will turn uh, discuss how to make that into a video film. So to cut a long story short, out of those twelve meetings came twelve video films mm -hmm. in four months, which they had. From that first meeting, each ward had produced its own ideas about this video, about what the Borough Town Plan could do, and then demonstrated it through the video. We had a cameraman, and I acted as the editor for the programs, and so each of them produced about uh, a, um, a 10, 12, 15, 20 minute program. Very successful, very successful indeed. And act, those videos acted as a kind of reference point for the planning process for years afterwards. However, what was really, what I learned out of it, apart from the fact that you can make this sort of video work, was the group dynamic process. But in fact, putting people in front of a flip chart with a, 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 a facilitator and in, inviting them to contribute their ideas and flagging them up and then collecting them together and prioritizing them and so on, is a tremendously powerful process. And so um, from that, I started to offer uh, participation and uh, um, um, participatory uh, 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 facilitation, facilitating participation process using those kind of group dynamics. And the uh, over the late 70s, uh, during the late 70s, I had about um, two or three a year of these projects with facilitators drawn from the uh, creative, creativity um, um, group at the Manchester Business School run by then Dr. Tudor Rickards. 
And um, we need to be successful in planning, in health service, in uh, leisure, and all sorts of things, issues. But we couldn't figure out why it was that the city council didn't sort of embrace us because we were cheap. God knows we were cheap. They hardly paid us anything. Right. Uh, and they actually solved a lot of problems that they'd previously been able to solve. But it was only when I read a book called Participation in Democratic Theory by a woman called Carol Pateman that I realized that, in fact, we had a problem, theoretical problem, that what I thought we were doing was democracy, was in fact, what democracy was, was something else entirely. Mm -hmm. And that was when a huge penny dropped. Uh, and that I thought that democracy was what Abraham Lincoln said, government of the people, by the people, for the people. Whereas, in fact, as Joseph Schumpeter, the Austrian economist, said, it is a, a process by which elites compete for the popular vote in order to have the right to take decisions on behalf of the whole uh, polity. So, when we have a competing elites model of democracy, now, you probably, uh, I mean, the thing that shocked you was that there is such a theory as a theory of democracy, mm -hmm. that, that it's not just what we all understand it to be. Yeah. So this is where, um, in the book, you say one of the participants said that you discovered a, or they participated in an impeccably democratic process. Um, and you also say the more we tried to persuade power holders uh, to build on our work, the clearer it became they didn't want to listen to our arguments. Um, yeah, right. And uh, so you move on then. Uh, and, and became a research fellow at the Manchester Business School. And where did you build on the video experiences yeah. and, and apply that in in the business? Because the one led to the other, did it not? Or did... Yes. Um, the um, I was I went to Tudor Rickard, who was at the business school and uh, uh, lecturer in creativity, and. Um, I, I said, I've come across this extraordinary thing, that there is a theory of democracy. And Tudor was just as surprised as I was. Right. I said, and, you know, we've had these very successful processes. People have said that they're impeccably democratic and they deliver very good results. Using um, creativity and systems dynamics processes, facilitation and so on. And yet the we are clearly in conflict with the dominant theory of democracy, mm -hmm. which very the competing elites theory, because you take the you go to election, you get elected, and then you have the right to do what you like until you you lose the next election, and you don't need to involve the people at all in that decision making process. And I said, I think it's interesting. And he said, Well, yeah. Um, why don't you Why don't we ask the director if that you could come here to the business school and do, do work on this? So I became, through that, went to see the director, and he said, yeah, sounds very interesting. If we can find someone to organize a project around, around this, then we'll do it. And there was a participation research unit run by a lady called um, Professor Enid Mumford, a very fine lady. And she was doing a lot of participatory work in the industry. And we found, um, we got funding from the Anglo-German Foundation to look at uh, participatory approaches to managing major systems changes. It wasn't in the public sector, it was a business school after all. And we interviewed uh, in four different firms, 150 people who had been involved in, um, in, the, in participatory approaches to managing major system changes. And again, it was clear that they worked extraordinarily well and were very cheap and produced extraordinarily good results for complex, tackling complex issues in big organizations. Um, and um, out of that uh, came for me, uh, I mean, also not only learning from uh, Enid, but also the idea of systems theory and system thinking was new to me. And because one of our colleagues at the business school was the very wonderful Stafford Beer, and the, one of the founders of cybernetics, I learned a lot about cybernetics at the same time, but really didn't understand fully the importance of it at the time and uh, and also 
I understood for the first time the importance of leadership in um, in participation, uh, because when I realized uh, I'd been given Paulo Freire's book to read, Paulo Freire is a Brazilian educator who wrote a lot about um, the use of dialogues versus monologues as part of the, uh, the, the learning process. And he says that dialogue is liberating and monologue is oppressive. And the dominant style of management and in uh, and government and in politics is monologue. Whereas effectively what our work was doing was, uh, was looking at dialogue in action. Mm -hmm. Dialogues for problem solving and for problem posing. So that was enormously important and out of that came my idea about the relationship between participation and leadership and the importance of what I call liberating leadership uh, in developing effective organizations and effective um, uh, systems through participatory processes. So you went on from there then to write the book Guy and Democracies. Yeah. Um, in Guy and Democracies, you pose this uh, feedback model that we react to the environment. Um, how do super competent democracies take those ideas further? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I think that's very, uh, it, it's a huge developmental process for me because during, the, during that, the interval between the business school and writing uh, uh, Guy and Democracies, which is the early 2000s, which is over 10 years ago, we wrote Guy and Democracies. Um, I worked as a consultant in systems change in all kinds of organizations, public services, using participatory processes that I'd learned at the business school, running workshops on uh, 21st century leadership, uh, offering this notion about liberating leadership combined with participation, and again, having a fair amount of success in that area. Um, and seeing Stafford's work, uh, understanding Stafford Beer's work on cybernetics in Chile and so on, and how that had worked. So I became in a sort of, my thrust, my, my um, focus was on participatory approaches to managing major systems changes. And if, you know, in a hugely complex environments. And uh, that you can't manage those changes using the traditional command and control leadership, using managerialism, the conventional managerial approaches. You had to invent managerial management anew. And um, so when we came uh, to write something for the Schumacher Society, the obvious thing to, to recognize was that the biggest and most complex system of all we have to deal with is Gaia, is the planet itself. Mm -hmm. And so we have to manage our societies in a way which they um, work symbiotically, as a systems term, with the Gaian system. Mm -hmm. And so as Gaia varies, we have to vary with it. Otherwise, we're done for. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's climate change or pollution or... Uh, uh, the erosion of the rainforest, whatever it happens to be, we are, this is pr pr primarily our relationship with Gaia that has to be managed using our understanding of systems and, and um, uh, cybernetics and also of the importance of dialogue as a way of the human family managing those, those relationships. So then I realized that in fact very few people know about this <clears throat> and that one of the major concerns of all management <clears throat> as, as evinced by a, a, a PricewaterhouseCooper survey is that 70, over 70% of chief executives said their main worry is managing complexity and very few of them had any idea about how to do that. Mm -hmm. Whereas in fact managing complexity is what government and what participation and what democracy is all about. So it was clear that the conventional competences of management were simply inadequate. And we had to sort of relabel, reframe systems thinking, cybernetics, and dialogue, liberating leadership, all of that stuff as a different sort of way of thinking. So hence, I'm calling them super competences. Mm -hmm. uh, and with those, then our democracies really can 
work out how to become increasingly um, uh, sustainable, increasingly just, increasingly viable, increasingly super competent, in order for us to be able to manage our relationship uh, with the Gaian systems uh, over time and in all those kinds of areas. It's very complex, but in fact, until we think in terms of systems terms and cybernetics terms, we're not going to do it. And it's the other thing to say is that cybernetics is not about cyborgs and about computerized people. It's about releasing the potential of the human family towards uh, to enable us to live symbiotically with the Gaian systems. Right. Uh, Roy, you conclude the pennies dropping section of the book um, with a section on winning the war of ideas and the winning of the war of ideas pennies. Now, this is the pennies dropping that identify neoliberalism as the major obstacle to the democratic uh, processes and systems that you put forward in supercompetent democracies. After writing Guy in Democracies and during this period of, of the experience going back to Hammersmith and going back to when you were a, a writer and television presenter for the BBC, and at what point did you identify neoliberalism as the major obstacle to democratic processes? The neoliberal penny took a long time to drop, really. I mean, I should have got it a long time ago. Um, but it started really when I went to, with my co-author, John Jopling, of the Guy and Democracies book, to the World Social Forum in Porto Alegre in Brazil. And the first thing that was astonishing was the number of people who turned up there. 50,000 people came to the World Social Forum in Brazil from all around the world. Secondly, that, that there were vast um, uh, auditoriums where two or 3,000 people crammed in to hear and discuss the ideas of Paulo Freire. Mm -hmm. And not once, but sort of three or four times that, uh, and so um, we got to know some of the people, although of course didn't speak a word of Portuguese, and this is all in Portuguese. But as many of those speak, spoke English, so over lunch and so on. And we got also to learn about the participated budget process in Porto Alegre, which had started when the Workers' Party, after the end of the military regime, mm -hmm. um, came to power as the um, taking over the city administration in, elected to be uh, the mayor and administration of the city of Porto Alegre, and about a hundred and hundred, more than a hundred other cities in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And almost immediately, they instituted something called the participated budget process. On the basis that any city, 95% of every penny that comes into the treasury goes out again on predetermined uh, budgets. You know, whether it's for the police or whatever, and construction projects which are three years into a five year project and so on. Um, but there's about a little uh, proportion, five, less than 5%, that is sort of uh, available income, that uh, is new projects. And um, so they said, why don't we ask the citizens how we should spend this? Mm -hmm. And so in the first year, they got about 1,500 citizens involved in the process. Uh, but by, that was 1989. By the time we got there in 2002, 2003, um, they had something like 50,000 people every year involved in a seven or eight month process to mm -hmm. determine how to spend the city's uh, available budget. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a, competition, a, pro, com, a competitive process. Mm -hmm. So obviously, um, and it worked extraordinarily well, and it, it did away with a lot of had been petty corruption, you know, uh, on, on contracts and things like that. Because the citizens, first of all, um, put up the proposal, proposed the project, then they argued it in front of their peers, mm -hmm. and then they were selected out of, say, 50 or so possibilities, then it would be narrowed down to 5 or 10 possibilities, and then they get professional help and then it would be uh, implemented. And the next year, they would come back and say how they'd done. Okay, mm -hmm. we had 300,000 hiais, 
for this swimming pool. Mm -hmm. And we've spent uh, 80,000 so far, and we've got all the plans, and we're about to start construction next month, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and so because the citizens were involved directly, uh, there was very little in the way of um, petty corruption. Right. It's not so petty if you, you know. No, no. Mm. Um, so that was tremendous. And so I thought, this is the logical place for me to be. This is where participatory democracy is actually going somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I'm up sticks in 75, uh, sorry, 2005-06 had an exploration, a proper exploration, and I went to a couple of conferences in the meantime. And I just loved the Brazilians, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, what's not to like about Brazilians? Mm -hmm. And um, and so I finished up in some 2007 in a city called Curitiba, um, talking to people there about applying my ideas about liberating leadership to the kind of stuff that was going on. Mm -hmm. it, they weren't doing participatory budgets in Curitiba, just to be awkward, mm -hmm. um, but it was a very interesting place for a variety of other reasons. It had had a, a very, very radical mayor in the 70s and 80s mm -hmm. who had instituted an extraordinarily effective um, uh, public transport system. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a model for almost any city in the world is the Curitiba public transport system. So, over the next three or four years, I got to know people, I got invited to do projects, I worked with the um, Federation of Industries and, uh, on um, a series of uh, programs and um, uh, workshops to, uh, on 21st century leadership. Mm -hmm. made some very interesting friends and contacts and um, colleagues, worked on projects together, um, did some uh, very interesting consultancy uh, with private universities and things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, the point came when there was a change in the regime in the city of Curitiba. Mm -hmm. It went left, it became a, a, a leftist government. And we were thinking about how to approach them to do our kind of work with them mm -hmm. at the city level. And we realized that in fact the whole process had been locked up. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to apply for, uh, offer yourself as a consultant, it was such a complicated process and it was basically only the big corporate consultancies like PricewaterhouseCooper, Avian uh, Avianza and people like mm -hmm. that who could actually get in because mm -hmm. they had the resources to get through the program. And it was a, so the, we were sort of locked out. But what was interesting, what came out of that was, what had, what had produced that situation? Mm -hmm. And why was it so locked into the whole of the um, right-wing conventional capitalist consultancies working with um, left-wing mm -hmm. administrations to modernize their and improve their um, services. Mm -hmm. And one of my great friends in the UK is a guy called John Seddon, who has been doing participatory systems change processes in all kinds of public and private service organizations. Mm -hmm. Very enormously successful. We've got about 60 consultants working on mm -hmm. And he runs across the same problem, even at that level in the UK. And what's notorious is that you know, huge amounts of projects go very pear-shaped, you know, whether it's at the BBC or it's the Department of Health and Industry, you know, Department of Health or whatever it is, billions of pounds worth of money is wasted. And the Commons Select Committee um, identified this as a recipe for ripoff. The way in which the contracts are written and um, um, consultancy is delivered is an absolute ripoff of the public purse. You know, mm -hmm. a new computer, for example, new laptop can cost five thousand pounds, where you can go and buy one in a shop. Mm -hmm. uh, a line of code costs you seven five thousand mm -hmm. pounds. You know, it's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I recommend reading a recipe for ripoffs. Mm -hmm. uh, which is an official government document with that title. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, so what was all, what was going on there? And as we talked, um, and as I explored what was going on, 
I came across this term neoliberal, which I vaguely knew. Mm -hmm. But the more I unpacked it, mm -hmm. the more you peel back the layers, the more you see at the core of it is this whole neoliberal project. Mm -hmm. It's this whole sense of hollowing out the public sphere and inserting corporate uh, uh, um, operators so that they then hoover out the public wealth mm -hmm. and take over in an, and, and have no kind of accountability really at all, mm -hmm. as, as the recipe for rip -offs say. It's almost, in, and they write contracts and so on. And so this is, I realized that the core problem was not getting ourselves into the, uh, the list of potential consultants, mm -hmm. but really taking neoliberalism on head, head on. So it then became a question of incorporating that into the new book, which was to be about, uh, which, which had already got the notion of super competences built into it. So instead of a 5,000 word um, uh, essay on uh, super competent democracies, I offered the, uh, it, it had to incorporate the whole uh, question of the larger uh, ideologies against which we were actually struggling without really understanding it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and once you look at neoliberal, what's happening in the, the neoliberal world, a mass of material comes up. Um, but essentially, people like Philip Mirowski um, have, have made an enormous contribution to understanding what's going on in his book. Uh, the Road from uh, Mont Pelerin is a classic, yes. and a, a later book called um, Never Let a Good Crisis Go to Waste. Right. Just a wonderful title. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, anybody who, uh, these are scholars who have spent years studying it, whereas I just sort of suddenly, rather like you, in your revelation in reading my book about, mm -hmm. um, uh, the first book about, um, um, the theory of democracy, suddenly I had that um, mm -hmm. uh, light switch go on about neoliberalism, that that was the enemy we had to take on head on. Mm 